If you, if you came to get advice on the future of the stock market and what to pick, I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. Uh, what, what I do want to talk about is, is the future of creativity, which is the theme of the conference today. And uh, how does that look to an economist? And the reality is that largely as it does today, but what I think is different, what I think is changing, is the scale, the scope of creativity in the economy. And I think a growing recognition on the part of policymakers that creativity is key to sustaining growth into the future and improving standard of living from generation to generation. But I think also there's a growing realization that policymaking needs to be more creative to address some of these challenges. Now, what do I mean by creativity? Uh, creativity, I'm thinking of, of innovation, of an ability that we have as humans to imagine the world as it doesn't now exist, to reshape our environment to manifest that reality. Now, that could be anything from a new song to a new genre of music to a new device for playing that music to a more effective method of transmitting and distributing that music. And let me give you an example, since uh, music is something that I enjoy and it's familiar to everyone. This is the phonograph invented in 1877 by Thomas Edison. It was revolutionary because it changed the conception of what was possible. You could record and then play back music on these thin sheets of tin. Compare this now to something invented 100 years later or so, the Walkman. Now, evolutionary is a product because it did largely the same thing, maybe a little bit more efficiently, a smaller space, but it was revolutionary in this sense that, again, people no longer had to go to where the music was. They could bring music with them wherever they went. That was a change that people hadn't conceived of back in 1877. And uh, if you think about the next iteration, the iPod, well, OK, and, and digital music in general, again, evolutionary, not that different from the Walkman in a sense. I mean, certainly longer battery life, you have a greater storage capacity, a better method of achieving those results. But it was revolutionary for this reason, that if you think about, uh, in, in, the, in the years that I grew up, I, if I was going to uh, sort of all the records and the cassette tapes and the music equipment and the CDs that I've accumulated in my life, I'm a big music fan, I'm a musician also, probably would fill up a space about this big. All of that music put on this iPod Nano wouldn't fill up the iPod Nano. And if you did put it on there, it wouldn't weigh any more than the iPod Nano did when it was empty. That is revolutionary, and I'll tell you why that's revolutionary. Um, but first, I'm going to jump back a second, because I want to talk about growth. Uh, my interest in economics began out of an interest in why some countries were rich and some were poor. Uh, when I was young, my family, we moved to East Africa, and we moved back to the United States. And what really struck me was not so much the difference uh, in the standard of living, it was the similarities. We had schools in the US, they had schools in Kenya, they had, uh, we had big office buildings with workers, they had big office buildings with workers. It was hard for me to see what the difference was. And when you study growth, you realize that it's a huge chicken and egg problem. Education matters, entrepreneurship, business investment, capital, public infrastructure investment. All of these things are important, but at the end of the day, they're really the transmission mechanism. If you think of the economy as a car, and you think of growth as, as a car moving forward, education, business investment, these are the, the, this is the transmission mechanism that turns the wheels that makes the car move. But it's not the engine. The engine, it turns out, is creativity. The engine is innovation. And, and if you don't believe me, think of this example. In 1983, uh, Apple computers trying to sell the, their 2E personal computer to, to uh, the American family. The American family could have bought this computer, but most chose not to. They said, we, we don't want to buy it. You know, why? Fast forward now to just 30 uh, years later, 2013, and um, most families in the United States have a personal computer in their home. In fact, many have more than one. Uh, why is that? What changed? Now you can say, oh, well, price must have come down. It's cheaper now, right? And actually, it's not. If you actually look at the price, I mean, a laptop today, mid-price laptop, I don't know, maybe pay 1000 bucks. It was basically 1000 bucks a decade ago. And adjusted for inflation, it hasn't changed that much. You say, oh, well, computing power has exploded exponentially. 
Yeah, but I mean, if you say in 1983, people weren't buying it because there wasn't enough computing power. No, that wasn't why. What changed was not the computer. What changed was us. We came up with new ways of thinking about how to use computers. So something that wasn't a profitable investment in 1983 suddenly became. Nobody, well, I shouldn't say nobody. Many people did not study computer engineering back in the 80s because there wasn't really demand. So suddenly, we came up with new ideas and ways to use the computer that fostered a huge industry, a huge expansion of growth. People suddenly going to college and the graduate school who hadn't before to study computers, uh, to write software, an industry producing computers. So what we have here is essentially creativity as the engine of growth. And the reason that the prospect that we could sustain growth infinitely into the future is because creativity is unique. It's something kind of like the fabled perpetual motion machine, the idea of a, a machine that could power itself indefinitely and go forward. And the reason is this. When you have a great idea, it moves the economy forward. It helps progress. But every great idea also fuels other great ideas. So Newton said, we stand on the shoulder of giants. And for that reason, we have the capacity if, for creativity to sustain uh, the standard of living on into the future. But you're going to hear a lot of optimism today about creativity. So I also want to inject a note of pessimism, because after all, economics is a dismal, dismal science. I feel like I wouldn't be doing my job if I was just coming up here and being wonderful. Uh, Productivity, innovation drives productivity, productivity drives growth, growth drives improved standard of living. But the history of the 20th century has really not been about us doing more with less. It's about us doing more with more, right? So we've got more people who are producing more stuff using more energy, and that's producing more pollution. Uh, the temperatures are rising, the height of the landfill is rising, the population is rising. Our, ex, uh, our use of non-renewable resources uh, is rising. And this can't go on forever. There are constraints that the, 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 the planet has. So what we need to do is to think about, in the 21st century, how to turn the equation so we produce value with less. We do more, but we do it with less. And creativity holds out the prospect of doing that. However, and again, more pessimism here, there are many in my field who are now starting a debate and saying, well, wait a minute. Just because creativity powers itself through ideas generating other ideas, that doesn't actually, it's, it's still a leap to say it's a perpetual motion machine. And some say that, in fact, it's subject to the same diminishing returns as everything else, as education and investment. And the argument they make is, is that uh, you can think of innovation sort of like picking apples uh, in an orchard. Right? You pick the, the ripest, lowest hanging fruit first, and then that nourishes you. You get taller, and you can pick the other apples. But, but they're harder to pick. And eventually, you, know, you, could, you could pick apples off the tree, or sometimes people talk about fishing the ideas, all the ideas out of the pond. Well, is that really a sensible way to think about innovation? It's hard to know, but their evidence is this. Think about this list. Uh, this is a list of just, I sort of jotted down some of the major inventions uh, that you could think of through human history. And their argument is that if you start at the top of the list and you say, OK, fire, agriculture, language, these things instrumentally changed our society much more than things like, say, the internet or the idea of complex securitization in the banking system or the iPod. And so their argument isn't that we're becoming less creative. Because if you think about it, the, the more recent inventions almost seem more creative. I mean, to me, the most creative thing on this list by far was, was the moon landing. I mean, that just blows me away to this day. It happened 44 years ago, and I still can't believe we shot a bunch of people on top of a rocket, landed them on a piece of rock out. And, I mean, that just blows me away. That was incredibly creative. It was an incredible feat. But what did we get out of it, really? So the argument isn't necessarily that there's limits to creativity, but there may be limits to the value of that creativity. In which case, if that's true, eventually growth will stop and we'll sort of stagnate in the standard of living. A better standard of living, maybe we'll, we'll have enough, but, but growth won't go on forever. I'm not going to try to answer that. I'm going to leave you to think about that. But I'm going to talk about one more thing that I think is important here. 
And this is the fact, as I alluded to earlier, the creative industries are different than traditional industries. And that means that they're going to require more creative policies. And here's an example of what I mean. Oh, I, I, I should, sorry, I should say first that the other aspect of creative industries is that they involve both the prospects of improved standard of living, but also greater risk. And one aspect of risk is the fact that even though we have miracles, not just of flight, but this is uh, an example of, of we've now starting to fly with no fuel. So we just uh, have solar powered planes that operate on no fuel flying. So this is incredible uh, creativity in how we can expand renewable, uh, you know, provide renewable sustainable uh, growth in the future. But flight also led to the prospect of falling out of the sky. Now, falling out of the sky, or I should say falling to one's death has, has been, you know, ever since we were cavemen, we, we fell out to our deaths. But falling a mile out of the sky is new. So we found more spectacular weights. Creativity leads to higher return, but also higher risk. And if you don't like this example, well, you can think of the fact that part of the free market has always involved speculation, and it's always involved uh, bubbles and crashes. But what we've done through our creativity is essentially to come up with more innovative ways to crash. And uh, I, I will say that um, what, you know, often people blame the 2008 uh, financial crisis on Wall Street. And I think that in many ways that's completely fair, but I think we have to be careful because outside of a few people may have been engaged in, in, in fraud, for the most part, these are individuals who are incredibly smart. I mean, think of it as a society. We took our best and brightest generation of, of students, math PhDs, science, engineering, physicists, and we said, you can get paid so much if you go out and you invent great new technologies to make the world a better place, or you can get paid 10 times that if you go to Wall Street and come up with complex new ways of packaging financial assets and creating electronic markets and selling them and creating algorithms to trade those at instant blind you know, speed of light speeds. And you know, we don't ever sort of turn that lens and focus on ourselves as a society and say, why is it that we are taking our creative energies and putting them in that place? So I, I think that we, we, want, we want to be careful about how we think about when we, we're setting out policies and institutions politically that we don't just sort of blame people. Uh, we think these are actually really smart, clever people doing creative things, and we should be proud of them. We should have just maybe perhaps reallocated their efforts towards something else. Again, a question I'll, I'll leave to you. But when you work in Washington, as I have, and, and honestly, I, all you have to do is turn on the, the TV set, you, you realize that there's a paradigm that people have in their head when they talk about the economy. And the paradigm is very much what you get out of Econ 101 class. Uh, this is a body of literature and economic theory that was produced basically in a 200-year period between about 1770 and 1970. And it fills the Econ 1 textbook. And it's very, very good theory. I subscribe to that theory. But this picture here describes the industry that people had in their mind when they were coming up with that theory. Uh, if you look at this picture, you can see a couple things. So as an economist, I say, OK, first of all, I can see there's an output. There's something that's clearly being made. This person's mining, and they can sell that product. Uh, there's clearly two inputs that are important here. One, you've got a miner who's willing to go down there and spend time in the mine, so there's labor hours. And the second is that that miner has a drill, a piece of capital equipment that some entrepreneurial mine owner said, I'm going to go and I'm going to invest in this technology. So you have capital, you have labor, you have an output. In a traditional industry like this, there are going to be markets. There are going to be free markets. They arise naturally. Uh, so people need resources, so there's a market for mining. Somebody says, well, I'll do that. Well, how will you do that? I need a drill. Okay, somebody's going to create a market for making and selling drills. I need people who are willing to go down to the mine. People raise their hand and say, I will work to go down to the mine. When the government steps in and tries to suppress some, a traditional industry, it actually has a really hard time doing it because they, they, they spring up like weeds. And I'll give you an example. Think about, for instance, the market for cocaine. 
the market for prostitution, the market for, uh, for human organs. Uh, uh, these are markets that the government has basically said, we don't want these markets to exist. So it suppresses these markets, and yet what happens is you get black markets that spring up because naturally these, this occurs in traditional industries. Market forces are too strong. If you contrast this picture with creative industries that are increasingly becoming part of the economy, you see a couple things. First of all, I would say the working conditions are much better. That's important. We shouldn't dismiss that. Secondly, you say, well, there's the same inputs. If this person doesn't show up for the job and spend a couple hours, nothing gets done. If they don't have a computer, they're not able to do their job. So you've got capital equipment, a computer instead of a drill, you've got labor hours. But these really aren't the key inputs, are they? The key input here is mental. It's intangible. It's the ideas. And the problem of intangible things like ideas is they don't function well with markets. You can't buy and sell ideas the way you can uh, because they're not physical, they're not tangible, and you can't establish property rights over them. In a traditional industry, say uh, even a service like ta driving a taxi, I can prevent you from getting my taxi cab if you want to ride to the airport. I can exclude you from that, I can charge you for that, and I charge you because it takes my time, right? There's resources involved, gasoline, and my time to do that. If you compare that to a creative industry, music, software, pharmaceuticals, all of these things, uh, once, first of all, if, 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 you, uh, if you're a songwriter and you come up with a song, there's nothing that physically keeps me from singing that song. And you, you, you can't exclude me. And also, if I sing that song, or if I download that song from iTunes, there's nothing that prevents any of you from doing that. Ideas are public goods, what economists call public goods, and they're very different. And the problem with public goods is that in contrast to traditional goods where markets are natural and they spring up when governments try to suppress them, with public goods, markets actually don't exist, and the government tries to make them. It's the opposite problem. And the biggest problem people have is piracy. It's that the markets want to fall apart and the government has to artificially create them. And I don't think that you have to be of any particular political stripe. I think fair-minded people can agree that if you have a market that relies on, on politicians and regulators to try to get it right, it's just not going to get, it's not going to be right as often. The balances aren't going to be right as if it's a self-sustaining cooperative effort. And so these are really the, 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 the challenges that I think that, uh, that we face. And the final one that I'll, I'll give, and this is the risk and the uncertainty. If you look at the person in the traditional industry, at the end of the week, they go home with a paycheck. If they put in eight hours of work, they get eight hours, pay for eight hours. In the creative industries, what you get is a lottery ticket. It's a lottery ticket that says, you can make $5 billion by the time you're 30, or you can maybe scrape by till you're 65 without a whole lot of savings because you never struck it rich. And the question we want to ask ourselves, I think, as a society, is if we're increasingly living in a society where our compensation is a lottery ticket? Do the traditional notions of, uh, of tax and redistribution and social safety nets discouraging activity? Is that really the case, or is it actually that these things could encourage activity because those sorts of insurance mechanisms and redistribution actually encourage us to take risks and be creative? Thank you.